The following is brought to you by Total Seal Piston Rings, the leader in ring seal technology. TotalSeal.com Hello and welcome to another edition of Hidden Horsepower. That's right, guys. We're back. My name is Joe Costello, and I am super excited because we have got a big one here today. Before we tell you about our guest, let's bring on the co-host of Hidden Horsepower. It's been a minute or two since I spoke with this man. He is the director of technical sales over there at Total Seal, taking a time off between answering those phone calls to knock out an episode. Mr. Keith Jones. Keith, how are you? I am doing great, Joe. It's it's great to be back. We've had a little bit of a hiatus through, you know, the show season and, you know, the first of this year getting, you know, all these orders filled and all these questions answered. It's been an absolutely insane time in all my years I've been doing this. I've never seen anything like it. And it just shows and proves how strong this industry is. Uh, no matter what we throw at it, it just keeps on coming back and asking for more. Exactly, exactly. And the audience has been hearing all of our episodes from the PRI trade show and all these personalities, but we had to get one in that is as fresh as can be. And you guys are hearing it now. If you love it, and I know you will, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, write a review, rate the podcast, share the show with your friends, because we've got a huge one today. Keith, this guy, I don't want to reveal his name, but he's got five Camping World Series Pro Stock World Championships and 99 career wins, the winningest Pro Stock racer in history. That should pretty much tip everybody off. It's Greg Anderson. Now, Keith, before we bring on Greg... It's a great get, number one, and this guy is knocking off the milestones. I'm super excited to talk to him about engine building. Oh, I mean, absolutely. I mean, like I say, we're we're talking to a living legend here, folks. I mean, if, if you guys, if if there's even a, a, a minuscule chance that you don't know who this guy is, uh, all you got to do is type in his name in the Internet, and you're going to find that this is the winningest pro stock guy. And every ounce of it, every bit of what these guys do is all about, you know, the, the effort, what they put into it, and the research, the time, the money. Uh, this stuff doesn't just fall in anybody's lap. It's a lot, a lot of work. And this is the, this is, an, and, and right off the bat, I'll throw this out there, you know, uh, my boss and my friend, Matt Hartford, uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, Greg this morning. And I said, you know, if you had to say one thing about him, he goes, hardest working man in the pits. And that says it all. Yeah, that and that's uh, that's what people have said as well. But let's not continue to talk about him and have him just like listen to us pour the praise upon him. Let's bring him on the show. Hidden horsepower, Mister Greg Anderson. Greg, welcome to the show. Well, hello, gentlemen. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Now let's be honest with everybody. The only reason you agreed to come on is because you want to hack on Hartford. That's a quote. That's exactly why I came on. That's right. One hundred percent. That's good. <laughs> That's what people want to hear anyway, Greg. That's what they want to hear. They want to have a good time. It's not all nuts and bolts. <laughs> but Is Harper listening, you figure, Keith? He will eventually. Uh, not at the moment, but trust me, he will be. <laughs> yeah, so just we'll, we'll set you. Room. That's, <laughs> <laughs> so there will be a time where he hears this, obviously, but feel free to save your best material. I'll give you a, a point. Uh, at which is the perfect time to to tell us a Hartford story or two, and also some advice for the next generation of uh, engine builders and racers. But that's down the road. Greg, one thing we didn't say about you that I think is very important, Keith, is that you are also the current and reigning Pro Stock World Champion. You just won your fifth. You just broke the the tie with WJ. You won your 99th career race, which says to me that you are... As, as current as you can be in your field. Sometimes we speak with legends who accomplished their goals and their milestones years ago. You are still right in the middle of it. Let me ask you, how competitive is pro stock and your industry at this moment? It's more competitive than it's ever been, Joe. And I, I know it sounds crazy. It sounds like a, a cliche because it seems like we say it every year, but the simple truth is it's true. It does get tougher every year. There's more and more people every year that figure out how to do it right, how to do it at the top level, how to win, how to build great engines, how to drive great. The field just keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper with quality drivers, quality engine builders, quality mechanics and crew chiefs. It's incredible. I, 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 I'm I, very, very proud of that championship last year, and, and I, I think the biggest reason is 
the competition level is, is so much deeper than it used to be. You know, if you go on to go back 5, 10, 15 years ago, you had two, three, four, possibly five cars that really could and should win. And now out of the 16 cars that qualify on Sunday, all 16 could and should win. So it, it's crazy. It's just it's what we wanted, I guess. It's what, it's what NHRA wanted. And, you know, when we, we kind of made a few changes in the class a few years ago to bring in talent at a reasonable rate. Uh, between the the elite team and myself here at KB Racing and, and the Magaha team and the uh, Frank Iconios, we brought in several new players and supplied them with great, great horsepower, great race cars, and all of a sudden, bam, you had a whole bunch of new stars and, and guys that could not only just get a chance to drive these things but get a chance to drive and win. So that, that's what's changed in the class, and uh, it's, it's a great show nowadays, and you really can't pick a favorite. You can't pick who's going to win on Sunday. So... We got what we wish for, I guess. It makes it very difficult on, on us guys that have been doing this for a long time and had a lot of wins out there because it's a whole lot harder to win these days. But you know what? It makes you feel a whole lot better at the end of the day when you do finally get it done when you win now. So uh, it's, uh, it's incredible, Joe. I think the class is stronger than it's ever been. Great stuff. Now, now I want Keith to jump in with some technical questions, but before we get to that, what I find to be interesting, and I always want to know, like, how did you get to this? Right? Like, okay, Minnesota. But when you were a young man, what were you doing? By the way, I talked to Daryl Gwynn moments ago, and he said, not bad for an old truck driver, is what DG (laughs) wanted me to tell you. He said, before he did anything, he was just driving his truck. We were driving down the road, you and Daryl Gwynn. Tell me about that. That's a fact. That is a darn fact. And we spent a lot of time up in Minnesota at Don Ness's shop up there building race cars and jumping in the haulers and heading down the road. And we logged a lot of miles together. Those were the good old days. And, and, you know, when, when I... When I first got involved with the sport, I was I was working with my father on his used car lot, selling used cars, working on used cars, fixing uh, fixing in, uh, rusty fenders and and, and brake jobs and engine jobs and and anything you could imagine, all the way to selling the, the units too. So uh, I got a w- real rounded ex- experience in, in education, basically hard knock school wise, about working on race cars and, and eventually. Uh, and took a job, got a job with a guy out of Minnesota by the name of John Hagen, who kind of was a kingpin in, in Division Five, along with Warren Johnson, and they were kind of the two hitters in Division Five and Pro Stock. So that's how I met Kurt and Warren. And uh, fast forward a few years uh, after we lost John in, in a horrible accident at Brainerd, I uh, kicked back, went back and sold used cars for a few years, and eventually joined back up with Warren and Kurt. And, uh, and that's kind of where my full-time Pro Stock career took off. That was, I think, in 1987. And there hasn't been a day ever since that I haven't been racing pro stock full time, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So I uh, I thank a lot of people for that. I start with my father; he got me started, and, and along the line, guys like like John Hagen and, and obviously Warren Johnson certainly helped get me to where I'm at today. So I've kind of had two lives. I had a life as a as a crew member and a crew chief, and working with Warren Johnson, and then moved out onto my own and and uh, started driving a car. And that was kind of my second life, and it's been a good run there since here at KB Racing. So it's uh, it's a lot of things to be proud of, and uh, I've had a blast with it, but I don't feel like I'm done yet. I, I'm uh, I'm still digging. As you said, we were able to get the championship last year, and, and it felt fantastic to do it at this stage of my career. And uh, I don't want to quit yet. I don't want to give up yet. So hopefully there's, there's uh, a few wins left out there and, and possibly championships too. Keith, jump in here with a question. Well, a question. I mean, I've got about a thousand questions, but uh, a, a lot of them Greg couldn't answer in a public forum. I'll just say that. But uh, one thing I wanted to comment on is, is you know, Greg having worked for Warren, and I've got a very good friend and customer, Gary Stinnett, and you know, and and I know you know Gary, and and you guys both work for Warren. I think Gary was there before you, and uh, just that work ethic and and that drive. Again, I go back to that word uh, that that you know, guys like you have is is. Again, the key to success, in my opinion, you know, Gary, not at pro stock, but, you know, you know, multi-time champion yourself, obviously, you know, mega time champion. You just see that. But, but what I want to throw out is, is a couple of questions. Uh, one, you had mentioned this just a moment ago. You know, let's say, you know, again, I don't know the exact date, but let's just say 10 years ago, all the work and the efforts that you put in and, and Jason and Andy and all the guys at the shop, you know, you worked on your engines. 
you know, is, is there a different approach or anything you do different? Now that you're, uh, you know, you lease engines as well. You have your own product. You have the ones that go. And I know they're all equal, and I know they're all, you know, nobody's getting anything different. But is there any different approaches or, you know, how do you feel about the whole leasing thing? Well, basically what it comes down to is, is we work every hour of every day on all six race cars, all six engines that, that you know, we have as lease customers, including myself. We treat them all equal. We try to make them all every bit as fast as, as Greg Anderson's race car and race engine, and that's what we do. That's just how we operate here, and uh, it, it's a different way of doing things than we used to. I used to be able to be selfish and just worry about Greg Anderson and Jason Line, and we could do everything in our under our power to make sure we could win races, and now I'm trying to do everything under my power to make sure one of our six cars is able to race and win races. So that, that's the, the main difference from years ago. It's it's just a change in in philosophy, but that's what it took to help save this class and, and make it more popular. So I'm okay with it. I'm good with it. It's just a new way of doing things. And uh, you know, you'll find it at the racetrack. You'll find it at the shop here. I spend every bit as much or more time working on customer cars as I do my own. So that's just the way it is. I'm, I'm good with that, and and I'm proud to do it. And nothing puts a bigger smile on my face more than one of our customers does does well and wins races. So it's a fun deal. It's a new challenge and it's a fun deal, but you know I'm I'm uh, I'm certainly I don't regret it. I I love every minute of it, and that's the way things are continue for the for the future here. That's the way it is these days, and that's what we're going to continue doing. You're you're right, Keith. There's a billion questions to ask this guy. We've got a few minutes with him, and I just want to reference to everybody the Gary Stinnett episode of Hidden Horsepower is up, and uh, you know Gary went through a tough time, but is doing much better now. And, uh, you know, shout out to Gary because I'm pretty sure that he I wanted wasn't... to ask you that. Is he doing better now? He's doing better now. The last that I uh, communicated yeah. with him, he's he's uh, he's on the comeback trail and feeling, uh, you know, light years Good. better than he did. And, and that's great stuff. And we just, uh, you know, Gary, if you're out there, we insist on seeing you at a racetrack, obviously, this year. Let's do Kansas. Okay, Gary. But um, you're not an engine guy, though, Greg. That's what's interesting about this. A lot of the guys we talked to on this show were engine guys from Jump. Right, like got a job in an engine shop, pushed the broom in an engine shop, became a machinist, and ran the machines and all that. Your road is a little different. Explain, explain that. Explain why. And learning the whole engine trade was necessity to get you to your true goal, which was victory. Yep, I was a car guy, no question about it. A car guy, and what what I mean by that, I was firewall back. Anything behind the firewall, that that's what I worked on. I was a clutch guy. I was a rear-end guy. I was a transmission guy. I was anything that had to do with anything on a race car from the firewall back in all my years at Warren Johnson Enterprises. And uh, really never spent any time, you know, far forward of the firewall. Warren and Kurt handled that part. So I didn't get introduced to that until I broke out on my own and started racing on my own and, and basically created KB Racing here and, and brought on Jason Line and uh, another guy by the name of Joe Hornick. And between the two of them, they taught me, how to work forward of the firewall. They taught me how to work on engines. So, you know, I've got those two to thank for, I call that my second career. I was a car guy in my first career, and now I'm an engine guy. So it's a completely different challenge, but it's it's something I was able to go out and, and, and find people I needed and that I really wanted to be able to take care of my car, to crew chief my car, to work on my car. Rob Downing and, and I hired a couple other guys that I thought were the best in the industry at, at working on a race car. and and being able to figure out how to make a car work. And I hired them, put them in those positions. So I said, well, now what am I going to do? I need somebody in in the engine department. So on came Jason, but that was a part-time gig when he first started. And on came Joe Hornick, and I was a part-time gig at the time. So I was the full-time guy. So I had to learn to work on engines. So when they weren't here during the day, they were over at Joe Gibbs working during the day. I had to work on engines during the day. So that's how I learned. That's where it all started, and that's what I still do today. And you know, I'm not sure that I'm I'm glad I did that because there aren't many days here when I finally walk out the door and jump in my pickup truck that I look back at the car shop and all those cars are gone. So why did I switch? How was I so so smart to switch from a car guy to an engine guy? And it seems like we even work harder than the car guys do. And, and I always thought the car guys were crazy. So it's, it's a, a never-ending deal. You're always searching for another horsepower. It's a huge challenge, but it's so doggone interesting. It's, it's You learn every day. And you never know it all. So it's a cool, cool deal, and I'm glad that I moved on to that side of the firewall. 
Uh, you know, and, and we're all glad that you did, Greg. And you know, just a, a couple of things, and I'm so glad that you guys have done everything you can. Uh, and you've obviously been, you know, a major, major part of what I'll call saving pro stock. Because there was a time there it was looking a little iffy, and right now it's looking to me stronger than it has in years and years and years. And great car count, and you know, and, and diversity within the field, it, it, it's great. But you know, with with Jason's retirement, and I know that you're in that shop every minute of every day, that you're not behind the wheel of that car. Uh, I know a lot of those responsibilities have fallen onto your shoulders. What it, what do you find it to be, you know, we'll say the most challenging thing on the uptake, if there is one, uh, of what he was doing that you now have to do? Well, I'm learning every day a lot of things that he did that I didn't realize he did. So it's, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> it, it's definitely heaped a whole lot more on my shoulders. No question about that. I, I just, I love being a worker bee guy. I, I love to work on the engines and, and basically just keep my head down and work. And to be honest with you, Jason handled a lot of the, you know, a lot of the phone work, a lot of the the, the dealing with vendors and, and ordering parts and dealing with customers and and you know that that type of the that part of the business that that I was fortunate enough that he handled it all. I didn't have to do it, and now I'm having to do a lot of that stuff. So that's the main difference. And uh, you know, I still got to do plenty of work in the meantime and, and still act like a worker bee. But I also got to you know pick up the phone once in a while and, and now order parts and. and talk to vendors and, and make sure we're we're running the business the right way so definitely a new challenge but we're going to go forward we're uh we're certainly not going to kick her in neutral we're not going to uh you know just slide the next few years we're going to try and make make things better here at kb racing and, and jason he he stepped back but he still comes in he was in this afternoon again so he uh he can't seem to quite cut it off cold turkey and, and i don't know that anybody that ever does this gig can cut it cold turkey so he still comes in quite a bit he does all the dynoing for us yet he doesn't want to give up the handle on that dyno. He loves doing that. So we still see him quite a few days a week. And uh, he's not 100% out, but as far as a lot of the, uh, you know, the dealing with the vendors and, and handling the parts and, and deciding what we need to be getting coming in and out of shop that he handled, I'm having to take that over. So another new challenge, but it's okay. And, and we're going to find, you know, better ways to go forward here. And, uh, you know, this KB Racing team is not going to sit still. We're going to find ways to get better. And uh, you know, we may not have gotten off to the best of starts this year, but we're going to be good. I, I promise we're going to be good, and uh, we're not going to go downhill. And uh, you know, It's hard to replace a guy like Jason, no question about that, but we're going to find a way. We're definitely going to find a way to do it, and we're going to go forward. And this is certainly not going to be you know, the last chapter of KB Racing's story. So we talk a lot about, you know, we're all, I, I say it over and over again, you guys have to compete against the nitro cars. They've got flames coming out the sides. They go, you know, zero to 330 mile per hour in less than four seconds. And they're, you know, Warren used to call them like what circus uh, freaks or something, right? But we, we we talk about the technology in pro stock as some of the most impressive in all of racing. To make three horsepower per cubic inch approximately out of a naturally aspirated engine is just pure insanity, and. That's where I, I, I would love to hear you speak a little bit on what impresses you about these engines. And I know that the average fan who just buys a ticket maybe doesn't understand it, but the sportsman racer understands it, and the hardcore drag racing fan understands it, and people out there in other forms of motorsport know that pro stock is the pinnacle of NA style racing. So, you know, you work on it every day. What would you say is impressive or most impressive about these engines uh you know wow factor for people who don't understand well what people don't understand is every minute of every day we have these engines apart back together we, we go race them on the weekend we come home after one race they're apart again they're apart because we're trying to find a better way a better thing to put inside that engine a, a change to make that engine to make it better and there isn't a week that go, goes by that we don't work on a, a different ring package, say with Keith and, and Matt and the guys out there. We don't work on a different hone. We don't work on a different, you know, gas port package in our piston, a different shape of the piston, a uh, different, you know, connecting rod. It, it, the cylinder head is constantly getting worked on. It, it just never ends. It absolutely never ends. And, you know, these engines, they'll live for 40, 50, 60, 70 runs, but they never stay together that long because we're always taking them apart way before that trying to do something different to them to try and make them better. And that goes on every single day of our life, and it'll never stop. And it seems like you learn 
something and then you go back and revisit something that maybe didn't work two, three, five years ago, and maybe now it'll work again. So you're you're constantly experimenting with everything, camshafts, intake manifolds. It just never, never ends. And that's the cool part of it, the fun part of it. Anything you can possibly dream up, think of, you come in and you can work on that day. And, and we have a great shop here at KB Racing with a complete CNC shop that we can build pretty much anything we want to build. So that's what we do every day. We build new parts and pieces for the in, inside of these engines every day. And it's, it's a, a great deal because you, you do all this work and you throw it on a dyno and you confirm you did good, you did bad, and you, but you always learn. Even if you go backward, you always learn what you can do from, from that information to move on and try something different. So it's a nonstop, 100% in effort, trying to find one, two horsepower every day, and it'll never stop. So it, it, it's a blast. It's, it's absolutely a blast. Keith? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, it, like you said, you, you try stuff, you test stuff, you find stuff that doesn't work, and like they said, you know, a million ways not to make a light bulb. Um, it, like yourself, I mean, we're constantly working on ring development, coming up with you know new face shapes, coatings, profiles, and know how hard you guys are working on the rest of the package, you know, honing board geometry, all those things. We've talked about this stuff at the track. Um, is there an area... That, I mean, the one that you're willing to talk about that you see, you know, the next level, where's the, you know, are you seeing, you know, I'm seeing gains in the head or the manifold or the cam, or is it just little bits of everything? Do you see any particular it's, it's area that's maybe been thing. left, it, let it go too long? Does. You know, It honestly doesn't seem like there's, there's a whole lot of big chunks to be gained these days. So you have to work on every single piece. And, you know, we spent a lot of time working with you and working with Matt and, and working with Total Seal, trying to find better rink packages, better home packages. And, and we've learned a lot together, and we're going to learn a lot more going forward. So that's just one of the areas we work on, but it's every single piece. There isn't a, a week that goes by that I don't do something different with an intake manifold. There isn't a week go by that we don't do something different with a cylinder head. It's just every piece gets scratched on because – we, we, we've been doing it so long that it just seems to come to the point where you're not going to find 10 or 15 horsepower in one whack at one in one area. So you have to find it in several different areas. But you know what? One or two here and one or two there and one or two there. And before you know it, you found 10. But it just doesn't come in one certain area anymore. So you've got to look a lot. You've got to dig a lot. You've got to search a lot. And, uh, you know, it just... But it's fun. It's it's interesting. It's it's always interested us, and it's it, and Jason's made no bones about it. That's what's interested him over all these years. The going to the racetrack and driving the race car that was cool, but that didn't hold a candle to being able to work here in the shop and develop horsepower. That's what he loves. And now that he gets to spend more time doing that, he's happier. He's a happier guy. So mm-hmm. it's it's a cool deal, and it's it, it's just a lot of fun. And and you know, out of the things, all the things you do. You probably your success ratio is, is maybe 10% of all the things you try. But you know what? We're okay with that. And, and you learn to take those lumps, take those, take those uppercuts to the chin where, you know, you put all this work in and, and the project just doesn't work out. That's going to be 90% of the things you do, but you still learn something from everything you do. So it drives you into the next project. And it, it's, just a, it's just a highly, a highly intense, job i guess you'd say and, and everybody here is the same way all these guys in the engine shop they love tearing these engines back apart after they just put them together and try something different put them together throw them on a dyno tear them apart try something different again it's just an all-in all-on deal and we love it here i just wanted to throw one more thing at you real quick greg just you know we saw some tremendous you know numbers you know in florida uh efi you know catching up to where I'll call it where the carburetors were. And, and, and I've just got to throw this out because I am how I, you know, I, you know, I appreciate fuel injection. I get it. I understand it. Uh, but, you know, I still dig carburetors and hood scoops as well. This is purely speculation. But if what I'll call the big reset hadn't happened in pro stock and you guys were still running carburetors and hood scoop, just, again, speculation, where do you think you'd be right now power-wise or, or well, ET-wise? you'd definitely be ahead of where you're at now. No question about that. that there's... This has been an interesting deal, this fuel injection project and, and experiment, whatever you want to call it. But the way that, that we decided to do it, it, it kind of restricted a lot of the things you could do that we used to be able to do with an engine. And, and it wasn't just that. When we switched to fuel injection, we limited the RPM you know, to 10.5 instead of unlimited. 
So the hood scoop was a great thing, and apparently some people didn't look, like the looks of that, but that was a great, great way of getting air in your engine, and we just can't do that anymore. So between those those three major things, it all ended up to you know, being a, a, a uphill challenge to try and basically get back to where we used to be in horsepower level. So with all the work we put in over the last six, seven years, whatever it's been since we've had fuel injection, if we still had a carburetor up top of these with a hood scoop and, and probably unlimited RPM, we'd probably be 500 to a tenth quicker than we used to be. But it's not the way it is, so we're not going to cry about it. We're not going to whine about it. This is the rules package we got, and you got to make the most of it. And, and uh, yeah, I... I wish we could jump back and in, into the old days because the cars would be faster, and I want to go fast. It's really the bottom line for me. I just want to go faster every year, and uh, if we could do that, we would be faster. But it still doesn't make make it any less challenge what you're doing now, or any easier to win or lose a race. It's it's still the same playing field for everybody, and you know who can do the best job with it. So, you know, I'm not complaining about it. So on on that point, now I'm wondering, you know, the ten five rev limiter. Uh, to me, as a layman, is the big limiting factor. I remember Jason talking about, you know, that he he loved unlimited unlimited RPM. Like that's what you know, spin it faster. It'll make more power. That kind of deal. Um, how has the ten five rev limiter changed what you do? Like I'm noticing, guys are hitting that rev limiter right at the stripe, and it's kind of slowing down the top speed on cars, but they're maybe getting it back in miles per hour. And it almost seems as if you guys have to work backwards from hitting the rev limiter right on the 1320 mark and, like, build a run from there backwards as opposed to previously where you're just spinning it as high as it can go. Does that make sense, what I just said? And how does the 10.5 rev rev limiter affect what you're doing? It's a challenge, Joe, and, and no question about it. If you if you don't get to that rev limiter before you get to the finish line, it seems like the cars just don't ET as well as they do if you get to that rev limiter, say, 50, 100 foot before the finish line. You just the quicker you can get to the finish line, the better off you are. And and if you spend you know another two tenths of a second on the rev limiter, the the what you lose for that in maybe a mile an hour or two mile an hour speed only equates back to a couple, three thousandths of a second, right? Well, you feel like you can make more than that up in the first 1,200 foot of the racetrack if you get through the gears quicker. So that's really what it comes down to. But the real challenge is getting through all the gears and getting shifted right at the limiter, right at 10.5 without going over the board and without sticking your nose in the steering wheel and basically hitting the chip. So if you go out there and you shift 100 or 200 RPM before that rev limiter, the car slows down. If you hit the chip and it spends time on the chip, you slow down. So the runs you can make where you shift it exactly at 10.5 before it hits the chip and none before, none after, you run your best run. But try and do that every single run, five gears every time. It's very, very difficult. So it's made it more of a challenge not only to make the cars run as good, but to make a perfect run in the race car driver-wise, shifting-wise. That's become a real, real challenge. Keith? Well, that's a very interesting point because, you know, having been privileged to looking at, you know, a lot of match data and especially in the, you know, in the in the lower gears, you know, like you say, missing that shift point, even by a small amount, how that, you know, extrapolates to the top end, what it's doing going through the lights, it, it would be an interesting thing to, we'll say, post or put up some of that type of data so that the fans can see, you know, and understand the challenge that the drivers got. And, you know, to hit that shift point, how critical it is, you know, to not be off 50 RPM. It's, it's, you don't think about that, and the acceleration rate of these engines is so incredible. How, you know, we'll just say how Swiss watch precision it's got to be. And, and like I said, I've been privileged to see that data, but a lot of people haven't. Uh, and when you watch it on TV and how fast things happen, but you got to think of the minds of, you know, of, of the greats like Greg that, you know, have got this thing dialed in like a stopwatch. It's incredibly difficult. And we'll just say, I, you know, I applaud these guys at what a challenge it is. Greg? Yes, Joe. Take me back to the naturally aspirated unlimited era. Can you tell us now? how high you were turning those things is that like public information now i mean nobody's using them anymore it's no big secret anymore we, we would run 11 7 11 8 joe and and uh you know we never quite made it to twelve thousand, but i'm sure we would have within the next year so it was 
you know, don't get me wrong, it was probably getting a little bit out of hand, and I'm not saying we need to go back to maybe unlimited, but I'd sure like to see it get a little bit higher than 10.5. It's, uh, it's definitely a limiting factor, no question about that. So, you know, we, we, we all did it. The reason we did it was, was, you know, people thought it was a cost factor, and it cost an extra mo- amount of money to run higher RPM. And whether it did or didn't, you know, I guess that's, that's not even the point anymore. I just, I guess I feel like we, we made too big a drop, and, and, and we could have certainly maybe gone down to, say, 11,000 or something like that, and the cars would be a little bit faster, and uh, I guess everybody would be happier. So that would be my only wish. Uh, don't know that it will ever happen, but as I said before, I just want to go fast, Joe, so whatever it takes to make it go faster, that's what I'm for. So if another 500 RPM could maybe come from the NHRA uh, ferry over the next couple of years, I'd probably be happy about that because we'd all go faster. Excellent, excellent. So you mentioned the six cars you work on. In addition to your own, there's Roger Brogdon, there is Kyle Koretsky, Dallas Glenn, who has been, uh, you know, young kid working with you guys for several years now, has gotten an opportunity behind the wheel and doing such a great job, won Rookie of the Year last year. You provide engines to the Kramer team, Derek Kramer, and then there's Matt Hartford. I think this is a perfect opportunity to hack on Hartford, as you said. Uh, What's it like working with Hartford, Greg, or working with uh, Matt Hartford? Well, he's probably the weak link of those of those six that you mentioned there. So it, it's always kind of a, a babysitting deal, kind of a, a extra challenge for us. But we enjoy extra challenges. So you know, Matt needs a little bit of help once in a while. But but he's always got a special child. You know, everybody's always got that one in the family that needs a little bit of extra attention, and that just happens to be Matt. But but that's okay. We're okay with that. And, and you know, he's a pretty good guy. So we put up with it. We live with it. Keith, do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. There's a, there's a lot of special <laughs> handling required there. Keith, are you sure you agree with that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't lose my job. Sure. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, just just listen. Just uh, he's he's been great. Uh, tough tough start to the season though. Getting there, moving there. It's but it's as you said. It's it's so tough. What about your arch rivals over there at Elite? Right, like you guys kind of worked together behind the scenes to agree on changes that now everybody agrees saved the category but you guys compete at a very very high level and it's very intense the way it works out it is very intense but 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 believe me joe there's a lot of respect Uh, you know you can't deny that i certainly respect that whole race team and and what they're able to do and and i think they respect us for the same reason we're all we're all hard workers we're all chasing that same you know trophy we're all we're all (laughs) digging after after the rabbit the same way and, you know, we, we get along fine until we line up against each other, and that's war. But that's the way it's supposed to be. And I don't see that any different in any other sporting event. I watched the Masters this weekend, and, you know, I bet those buddies, those guys are pretty good buddies when they walk off the golf course. But when they're walking on the same hole and they're competing for two, three million bucks, they don't speak to each other. They don't like each other. They don't, they don't, they don't wish any well to the other guy out there. So that's kind of the way it is, and I guess that's the way it is in any major sport. We're good with that, but but we're civil. We certainly get along fine, and and uh, you know we do whatever we think we need to do to make the class better. I think it's the bottom line, and it showed. It's absolutely showed dividends. So, uh, you know, if we hadn't decided to work together and and to, you know, agree to disagree or agree to agree either way, we wouldn't be where we're at today. So we made the right decision, and sometimes you just gotta you gotta swallow your pride, and you gotta basically find a way to work together for the better of the class, and that's what we did. You did, and now there's been over 20 cars at every race quite a while. It's uh, difficult to qualify at all, which is fun for fans to go and see, and uh, I think it's getting better and better. Keith, jump in with a question for Greg. Well, yeah, this this is a little bit more of a tech thing. I kind of bouncing back to what Greg said about RPM, and we'll just say, you know, from where I am, I just I know what I hear. I don't know this to be fact, but if they were to raise the the RPM limit to say 11,000, do you think that would afford and I'll throw it out, the Hemi head to make its presence known again in pro stock. I mean, there's guys out there that, you know, they're, they're so brand loyal, they're not putting the Chevy in their Dodge or Ford. They're just not going to do it. And, and I know some people that have maybe, you know, sitting on the, you know, sitting on the sidelines. And, and again, I only know what I hear. But do you think, Greg, that at that RPM level, it might allow that type of cylinder head back into the game? And, you know, maybe bring some people back out, you know, get, you know, get 24 cars at every show, 26 cars at every show, uh, you know, just opinions and thoughts. 
very possible. You know, I guess I, I wish I could answer that as an expert on a Hemi head, but I, I have never had a Hemi head in my hands. I, I've never, we've never worked on one. Don't really know that much about them. So is that the real hold back? Do they just flat need to run more RPM? I don't know. That's what certain people say. I don't know if that's actually factual or not. So I guess I don't have a great opinion on that. But if if, if there's people out there on the sidelines that if the RPM were to change to that, that they'd say they would jump back in with a Hemi, absolutely. And it's better for the class. So bring it on. And, and, uh, and it may very well be the truth. I honestly don't know, Keith. I'm not an expert at that. Uh, I just honestly have, have worked on, you know, Chevy Head for all my career. So I, I guess I don't know what to say about that Hemi. But if the people that have worked on them in the past think that that's the case, then maybe we need to push harder for that. Interesting. And and I don't know that any changes are going to be coming down the pike, frankly, just because uh, when you look at the category, it's really great right now. Like, look at the finals out there at, uh, you know, four wide Vegas. You had multiple different engine builders all represented. All You know, Frank Iaconi, you referenced Frank. Frank's been on hidden, uh, horsepower in the past. One of the better episodes, in fact. And, you know, all, you know, all of a sudden, his engines are within 10 horsepower of what Elite is doing. And everybody is close, and it's coming down to which team works better on a given weekend and uh, which driver drives better. It really is, Joe, and, I, and I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to tell you between Frank Iaconio's engines and, and Chris McGaha's engines and the Elite engines and the KB Racing engines, there isn't 10 horsepower between any one of them. Uh, it really is that close these days, and it just comes down to the job you do tuning at the racetrack, the job you do with the race car, and the job the driver does shifting. I mean, it really is that simple. They are that close. And that's why you see so many different winners. At KB Racing, you guys flirted a little bit with the factory stock showdown supercharged small block engines for a while. I'd like to know the status of that program, but also and really only in the context of the new category factory experimental that has been announced by the NHRA, which is basically those engines with Liberty style transmissions in a body that is exactly duplicate of a modern Camaro with a 10.5 slick. It's kind of like a totally new creation they're calling factory experimental. Everybody seems very excited about it, and I, I don't know what your take is. You guys have worked on those engines. What's your take? Well, we definitely have worked on them some, Joe, and, and, and unfortunately we haven't had a ton of success just yet. Obviously we haven't spent enough time working on them. We spend, you know, the the... the a great amount of our time here working on our pro stock engines but we have spent a little bit of time and, and and we're going to have to spend more time on them in the future because there are things with the new class coming in and the way that this is going to be that's going to be the power plant that's going to be the engine that supplies those cars too so we're going to have to spend more time we're going to have to up our game we're going to have to learn what it takes to make them cars run like our pro stockers run so it just takes time everything takes time we're going to have to devote, devote more of that to it in the future here, but we're going to. We will, because it's definitely something that seems to have a little bit of traction out there, and there's a lot of people interested in it, and even a couple of our rental customers are, have interest in it and want to do it. So we have no choice. We've got to learn about it, and we've got to play with those engines and learn about blowers, something that's kind of a foreign word to us. We don't know much about them, but we got to learn. So, you know, we're up for the challenge, and we're going to do it going forward. I know people are excited about that class, but I, I had a little moment of sadness in that some have suggested that that may ultimately could be five years could you know who knows how long but that could be the pro stock platform and i just felt sad for naturally aspirated racing right like without pro stock what is the pinnacle of naturally aspirated yeah i, I don't believe that i don't believe that that'll be the end of pro stock there's still so many things different with pro stock than what that is or what that can become uh, you know, and the strongest pro stock is right now, and, and we certainly see ways to make it stronger yet. I don't think that's going to be the case. I'm not worried about that. I certainly heard a few people mention that, but I personally am not worried. I'm not feeling that way. I think pro stock is going to continue to get more popular yet. And, uh, you know, with all these young guys we've got coming into the class, it, it's going to be fantastic going forward. So I, I don't feel that way. There's more room for other classes, and, and, and it's great that these are coming along. But I don't think it's going to replace floor stock. At least that's my belief, and uh, you know, I'm making plans to to continue racing in pro stock for as many days as I'm still around this this great earth. So, you know, that's my take on it. Keith, final question for Greg, and then I'm going to hit him with our uh, advice for the next generation concept. Well, well, this is a question that you know that I'm just throwing out. I don't know the answer to this, and if you don't want to answer, 
uh, it, that's okay. But it, you know, we're talking about you know Jason was coming in. He still runs the dyno. He still, you know, he's still pulling the handle. Uh, have you guys and and you may already be doing this, and I don't know the answer. I'm just throwing this out. I, I have a lot of customers that say some of their biggest gains lately have been getting away from the engine dyno. And they're going to hub-mounted dynos, or they're or they're dynoing the whole car. They're looking at you know recovery changes, you know things that they thought worked on the engine dyno, didn't actually translate itself all the way to the rear wheels. Have you guys played with that kind of stuff yet, or are looking at it in the future? Have not, Keith. That, that that's kind of a new one to me. And, and uh, you know, Jason Line is definitely a uh, an engine dyno believer. And uh, you'd probably make him cry if you told him he had to start doing a hub dyno, but that's okay. You know, things change. You got to pay. You got to change with times as they come. So if that day comes where we need to, you know, look into that, we certainly will. We are not doing that yet. Haven't looked into it yet, but uh, it's certainly interesting. And it, you can't ever be, you know, completely closed-minded on things. You have to consider everything. And, and you know, I think as we go forward here, obviously we're. We're going to have to make changes as we go forward here. And, and as Jason steps away more, we're going to have to do things a little bit different around here. So we're wide open to anything. And if that becomes part of our deal down the road, that's just fine. We're definitely going to be open to change as we go forward. So uh, we're not going to be stuck in our ways. We're not going to be stubborn. And we're not going to just say, well, we always used to do it that way. So that's the way we got to do it. That is not going to be our motto here at KB Racing. We're going to be willing to change with the tides as they go and because uh, we want to be around a long time. Excellent, excellent. And uh, we always end off every episode of Hidden Horsepower, hopefully, hopefully thinking that out there listening in our audience that they're the next generation of engine builders is curious and listens to this and is trying to get a little bit of advice, right, advice how they can be successful. So what would you say to that person out there? You know, you did it in real life with Dallas Glenn. Right, Dallas Glenn was, uh, you know, willing to pick up a broom and push the broom and learn. And look what he's doing now, Rookie of the Year, great young man, and uh, and really following in the footsteps of you guys. But what would you say to the average person out there who loves engines or has that mechanical knowledge or desire, and they want to get into the business, into the trade, they want to follow in those footsteps? What's a good, uh, you know, good some good advice for success? Well, like you talked about Dallas, my story isn't much different. I started out, you know, almost sweeping the floor too. Had no grand aspirations of becoming a a, a great crew chief, of becoming a great race car driver, of becoming an engine builder. I just wanted to work on cars. And, and if you've got that desire, you just want to work on engines, that's what you need to do. And you need to dig as hard as you can. You need to work as hard as you can. There's, there's, in my story, it, it certainly wasn't done by brain power. It was done by hard work. And you have to buckle down, and you have to basically just be willing to work as hard as you can. And I thank Warren Johnson every day for that. There wasn't a day as hard as I worked. There wasn't a day that I could beat him into the shop, and there wasn't a day that I could leave after him. So, you know, he set the example. And, and uh, you know, it's it's just the only way we know. that That's the way to do it. So uh, unless you're, you're gifted with a rocket scientist brain, you got to do it the way we've done it, which is, you know, the hard knuckle way by, by, by never giving up and by just continuing to work at your passion and work at your passion and do what you love. And eventually things, doors open up and, and another avenue opens up. And, you know, lo and behold, all of a sudden you're a great engine builder and you're, you're out renting engines to, to the class of pro stock or whatever it is. It's just, you just never know. So just keep working hard. That, that's the bottom line. That's the secret. And uh, never give up your dream, never give up your goals. Just keep keep digging, and doors will open as you go. Amazing, amazing. That is great. So it doesn't have to do with being from Minnesota then? Well, you certainly work at, you learn that hard work ethic up there, I guess, but you still got to continue it. No matter where you're at, what part of the world, or what trade you're in, you still got to continue, and you got to do the best you can to outwork everybody. And, and uh, you know what? It just... Nobody ever got hurt by working too hard. They may got tired and they had to go home and go to bed, but it doesn't hurt. It just it, it never ruined anybody, and it's made a lot of people, you know, stars and heroes. Excellent. Greg, thank you very much. Amazing episode. Keith, final thought for Greg. I just want to say I know part of where that hard work ethic came from because I was just back in Minnesota about a week and a half ago, and just about every shop I went and visited was out there shoveling snow. So they, if they wanted to do anything that day, they had to shovel the snow first. So uh, we'll just say, 
Yeah, absolutely. You stop moving. Like say, you're done. Six inches the last day I was there, so good Minnesota weather. <laughs> yep. Greg, thank you. But again, I want to say th- th- I want to just want to say thanks, Greg, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Uh, enjoy everything you guys do and, and, and working with you, and it's, it's been an honor and a privilege. It's been an honor for us, too, and thank you, Keith. And, and, and Joe, this has been great. Thanks for having me on. And, uh, Keith, let me know if, 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 if your job future gets a little, little shady after hacking on Harford the way you did. Give me a holler. Yeah, yeah exactly. Any, any, final, any, <laughs> any final Hartford stories just in parting? Greg. Go ahead, throw it out there, Keith. No, yeah, okay. Yeah. You spent a lot of time around him. <laughs> he, turns, no, okay. he turns it around. Yeah. Well, uh, there, there's a there's a whole ton of them, but we'll just say for you know for those of you that, that you know that know Matt and visit with Matt, uh, I, I won't get into all the details, but and and Greg will know this hotel, uh, the you know the hotel at the Cuyahoga Falls in Ohio during Super Summit. And I know Greg stayed there because I've stayed there. Matt stayed there many, many years ago when they were doing the Super Summit shows. And for those of you that know Matt, just ask him how close I was actually able to get him to his room uh, directly leaving the rental car. Uh, that's a, we'll just say we'll, we'll, we'll leave that there. But uh, for those of you that know Matt, just ask him. Excellent. There you go. And in fairness, you know, if we're going to hack on hard for that bad, he should be here so he can defend himself. It's, it's all he should. And in fairness, he's a good time. He's definitely a good time. So he's a good dude. He's a good time. And we've been having a ball with him. Uh, I've enjoyed racing yeah. with him and hope we continue a long time. It's fun to hack on each other. We certainly give ourselves plenty of ammunition each both ways. So that's just good. That's all good. And it's all fun. And that's what makes racing fun. There you go. Greg, thank you for spending time with us on Hidden Horsepower. We appreciate you. Congratulations. 99 career wins, five championships. You got that big milestone still out there and plenty of races to go to go out there and achieve it. Good luck. Thank you very much, guys. There he goes, Greg Anderson, with us here on Hidden Horsepower. Keith, that was tremendous. As, as I expected it to be, Greg, such a great guy and such a wealth of knowledge, and I'm sure there's a, a million war stories that he can, will say, relish upon us in, you know, in a future episode. Uh, again, such a class act, hardworking. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I talked to Matt about it quite. He said, there's just nobody that works harder than this guy. You know, I, I went out there and I, you know, and I, and I Googled him just, you know, as Joe, I know knows, but I want, you know, what, what's, what, what is he a golfer? What is he doing? And, you know, and it's like, no, he works. This is what he does. He is so passionate about this. Every spare minute is dedicated to making that car and that team faster. He's got an old school Silverado. He just cruises back and forth. He likes classic rock. He is like the ultimate American car guy and still doing it. Winning that fifth championship last year was a big deal. It was a great fight right down to the wire. 99 wins, trying to tie and then ultimately surpass his mentor, Warren Johnson, who we worked with so many years. And now he is closing in on becoming the you know, only pro stock racer with 100 wins in the National Hot Rod Association. Just great stuff. Keith, this has been fantastic. You know, I love the PRI episodes. They are great. But getting in one that is fresh and current and happening right now is great. And catching up with you is great also. For people out there who are working on their projects, they're trying to make horsepower, they're trying to unlock the hidden horsepower, and they want to get a hold of you, what should they do? Uh, just you know, just reach out to me. Uh, you can come to our website, totalseal.com. Uh, you can reach out to me through there. You can call us on the toll-free 800-874-2753. Uh, whatever way you find to work best for you, just you know, either email us, go through the website, call us. We're here to help. That is great. Keith, thank you so much. Excellent work, and we'll see you on the next one. Look forward to it, Joe. Have a great day. He's Keith Jones, the Director of Technical Sales for Total Seal Piston Rings. I'm Joe Costello. You can follow me, WFO Joe, on Instagram and Twitter, or check out my own show, WFO Radio, where we talk NHRA drag racing. And if you go out to an NHRA national event, you can see me there as well. Many more episodes in the archive, Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Check them out. Hidden Horsepower, presented by Total Seal.